Okay, we're back. We're live here for Community Matters. It's a five o'clock clock on a given Tuesday with Jerry Agrusa. He's a professor at the TIM School, Travel Industry Management School in the Shiloh College of Business. And he joins us from, is that right? He joins us from in front of that building. Yes, uh, this, is, uh, this, this is our the TIM School. And uh, right. yes, we are now part of Shiloh College of Business. Very excellent, Jerry. I haven't seen you in a while and it's really a delight. Um, and I saw that uh, article in the paper about the study, uh, the study about how people felt, that is people from far away, how they felt about local foods and local culture. Can you talk right. about that study? I mean, this is something that, um, you know, everybody is interested in this. The, the local people are also interested in this study. So uh, tell us about the study, what it, what it found and, and what it means. Well, we, we, we sent out a survey to uh, travelers to coming that are from the US mainland coming to Hawaii. And we asked a number of questions, but three main questions was the willingness to pay. Willingness to pay for uh, authentic Hawaiian cultural experiences and how much they're willing to pay. Number two, willingness to pay for items that are more sustainable. And number three, willingness to pay for locally grown food products, meaning produce, meat, fish, etc. So what we found is uh, a very high percentage, you know, over 70% said that they're willing to pay uh, more for authentic Hawaiian cultural experiences. And what we found is almost 20% were willing to pay 15% uh, or more um, for, for locally grown products. We got, we received almost 80% people were willing to pay e extra on their food bill, their restaurant or their hotel food bill. And 20%, more than 20% said they'll pay a higher than 16% or more. This, and one of the things that they stated was they're trying to lower their carbon footprint. You know, if we, because we're out here in the middle of the ocean, you know, it, it takes a lot to get here. And there is this, you know, with sustainability, there are people stating that they want to not use such a high carbon footprint. You know, we have global warming, et cetera. So one of the folks that I spoke with, they came with their, uh, their, their son, a, a lady, and she, one of the first things they did when they got to Hawaii was they wanted to plant trees to offset their carbon footprint from the airplane from LA to Honolulu. And I was just like, wow. Yeah. And then one of the things they did was they actually worked, they were there for, they were here for eight days. And one day they went and rebuilt uh, an ancient Hawaiian fish pond. And she said that the young, her son, 12 years old, that's all he could talk about. Not surfing, not taking a scuba dive, diver lesson, not snorkeling. That was the thing for him. And I think that one of the things that people have changed is, you know, they want to come on vacation, but they want to learn something. And one of the great unique things about Hawaii is our unique culture that differentiates us from say other sun, sand and sea destinations like Cancun. You know, we have this culture and we need to promote it. And as you can see in the results of the study, people are willing to pay more for this experience. And I think that this can help not just tourism as a whole, but it can help with, you know, we have a little bit of animosity these days with the, the local population. Because when we had COVID, when it hit, you know, 216,000 people were laid off like this. And we had the lockdown. And then all of a sudden we opened up, but tourism didn't come back. So people were able to go to the beach with no, not even looking for a parking place. People were able to drive on H1, like it's a Sunday morning, <laughs> with nobody around, you know, but they forgot that, you know, all their neighbors are unemployed because it isn't just the direct worker that was affected, the hotel, the restaurant, but we have all the auxiliary operations that support this industry. Like this one person said to me, well, we don't need tourism. And I said, well, what does your family do? My dad is a, he's a truck driver. Okay, what does he drive? He delivers fish. I said, was he laid off? 
Yes. Well, because the fish industry is so connected to the tourism industry, because there are so many folks when they come to Hawaii, especially those from the mid America, they want to eat fresh fish. And that, you know, all those folks were, were, are affected. And I, I, I think that we need to do a better job of letting the local public know how much this is the economic engine of Hawaii. At this time, more people are employed directly or indirectly by tourism. And we need to let people know that, you know, it, we need to support this industry. Now, is every tourist a good tourist? No. But we need to, you know, just like not everybody in any field is, is excellent. But we have enough good tourists. And what this study shows is we have enough folks that are willing to not just do the right thing, but pay for it. And, you know, um, I don't know if you saw this study that I did. In May of 2020, I did a study on U.S. mainland travelers' willingness to take a COVID test. Mm. And we found that 69% of the thousand people we surveyed said that they were willing to take a COVID test before coming, and 62% said they'd take a second one before they landed. This is May 2020, so we got the study out there and we sent it, and you know the tourism bureau and the governor's office, etc. And then they in October of 2020 decided to do the COVID tests. But I was in a meeting with some people and they said, well, who should pay for the COVID test? And one person said, the tourism authority should pay for it. I was like, what? The tourists should pay for it. Why? By putting the tourists to pay for it, you're, you're acting, you're, what you're doing is you're putting in an emission charge. And it's just like going into a museum. When the museums were free, you get a different clientele than someone who pays $25. Here we have $200 COVID test. So me, my wife, and two kids are getting on a plane. We're spending $800 before we even take off. So we're already committed to spending money. And that's the type of tourist we need here. We need a higher spending tourist, people who are willing to spend. And those that took the COVID test already committed to it. And this is before we had the vaccine. And then we, we continued with that testing, you know, all the way until uh, June. And then we allowed local residents that had a COVID card not to take the test. And then in July, we've allowed the tourists. And um, I, I think that, that we should go back to that because COVID is now, you know, we saw the governor go on television a few weeks ago and tell everybody not to come. He's, he did that because the hospitals are full. You know, our, our friends that work in, 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 the, in the medical field, especially the nurses, they're just so tired. You know, they're just so, so tired from this trying to keep people alive on COVID. And, you know, she, they, they tell me 95% of everybody who's in the hospital is not vaccinated. And this, and this virus is devastating to the body. It really, really is. And, I, and what science says is, if you've been vaccinated, it's just not going to take as, a toll on your body as, as great. How many are tourists in the hospitals? Right. I, don't, I haven't heard of one. I haven't heard of one. Mm -hmm. Now, do I've heard of tourists being in the hospital because they fell off a hiking trail and broke their leg? And, or, you know, there was one person I know I heard of that they had slippers on and they were hiking. Uh, in, in wet. What do you expect? You know, most of these yeah. people are just working in an office building and the only time they get up is to get a donut. And now they're going to go hike <laughs> <laughs> on a willy trail. So, so Jerry, what affected uh, the governor's uh, statement that he didn't want people to come? What did the effect did that have, both in the numbers and in, in the psychological reaction of those who might otherwise come? I think what, what it did was it, show, it, it caused people to cancel the trips further down the line. But he had to do this because the hospitals are overwhelmed. It's just full. When they tell you that if you get a heart attack, you can't come to hospital A, you have to go to hospital B. You know, I'm at a heart attack age. I don't want to have to go somewhere else because some guy didn't want to take a vaccine. And, you know, Absolutely. I've heard a number of stories where a person had cancer uh, treatment, and another person needed this other surgery they had to cancel because there's no room in the hospital 
because 95% of everyone in the hospital is not vaccinated. This is science. This isn't someone's right to do. And we, and we need to do what, what, you know, other countries that have opened up with tourism, like Great Britain, what do they say? You have to have a COVID card. You've got to take a COVID, negative COVID test before you leave in the 72 hours. And then you got to take another one when you land. And we could do that. We're an island. Nobody drives through here. And we would then be the safest destination. And then we can charge the premium price. We could be the, we could be the bomb, as they say. We could be it. Yeah, and people respect that. Yes, you know, people. I, <clears throat> back to your survey for a moment. I think um, just be, between the lines, uh, the reason that they're happy to pay more, the reason they're happy to have tests less less year, um, is because they respect Hawaii. They don't want to hurt Hawaii. They don't want to be a burden on Hawaii. They're good, as you say, they're good tourists. And a good right. tourist is, is willing to spend money to preserve the culture, to preserve the health of the people, you know, to treat Hawaii as a special place and not to dirty it up somehow. Um, and the question is, how, how did you find the good tourists as opposed to the bad ones? I, I, I actually did, I didn't find anyone. I actually had to pay a company <laughs> to send out the survey because um, you know we have now the COVID criteria. We're at level orange uh, as a university. Um, the IRB said that we're not allowed to go face to face. So I had to actually hire um, a company. And we've done a number of research projects where we've hired Qualtrics, um, uh, MTurk, and now it's called Mavido. Mavido, Ma Ma it used to be Survey Monkey, they bought it out. Mm -hmm. And then OmniTrack has helped me with some uh, local company, OmniTrack. I want to thank Chris Cam, he's the president of OmniTrack. He's been very, very kind to me. He helped me with a study that we're doing on local residents uh, on regenerative tourism in Kauai. So we're still trying to get that article published. It's uh, so uh, yeah, up. that's the next one, eh? Uh, can yeah. you talk about what you have going on down the line in these surveys? Sure. So we got we well, the, we just completed this one. We're doing another one on looking at images and um, on what tourists when they see a perception of an image on. Um, as an advertisement, would they be more willing to see themselves in that picture? And then we're looking at it from a picture that the hotel sends out versus uh, a, post, a person posting their own. So that's a, one that we're really working on right now. Um, the regenerative tourism from the resident standpoint in Kauai, uh, we've had it at two journals that they, we went for the top, top journal because um, right now that seems to be what it, our university is shooting for the double A. And then we went to that. They, they kept it for a while and then they kicked it back. We made the changes and then they, the editor said mm, he didn't think so. So then we went to the Journal of Travel Research and then yesterday they kicked it back after dancing around with it. So we're now with another tourism perspectives. So we should- It's very, it's very important to find out about these things on, on both sides of the equation. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, and, and I say that because I think we have to take and you are taking a close look at how this works. This is a time to examine, don't you think? Uh, so we can, you know, make changes, tune it up going forward. Uh, and, I, and I guess I would ask you, based on the surveys and, and also your, you know, your expertise and your teaching, um, you know, what, what do we need to do to tune this thing up so that it, it, it stays, you know, sustainable? Uh, and, and that it grows and, and becomes a worthy sector of a relatively speaking, because we're never going to be very diversified, but a, a relatively speaking diverse economy. Well, you know, one of the things is, you know, the good thing is we were, the product wasn't damaged, right? COVID didn't damage the product, right? We have the clean air, we have the clean water, the culture hasn't been damaged. We haven't had an oil spill or an earthquake all these things that come into effect. So the product that people come here for hasn't been damaged. And I, and I knew that, that we were gonna come back very quickly because the product wasn't damaged. It was that people's fear, first of all, we didn't know, we didn't have any vaccine for COVID. We weren't even sure how the transmission was. What was the vector? You know, we were getting different reports all over the place. Um, you know, so, so once we figured that out 
And then once they invented the vaccine, we started to ramp up and we really, really were rolling. The challenge was that we had folks that were getting sick here and the hospitals were full. And why, you know, the reason the governor had to go on TV to say that was that the medical staff was saying, we, what happens if we have a real catastrophe? If we have a, a you know, something happens, a building collapses like we saw in Florida. They, they can't handle it. It was full. They are full and they're tired. And I tell you, the great thing was that they got whatever, how many hundred nurses to come here to give these folks a relief because they were overwhelmed. You know, we have two nieces that are nurses and they both tell us all the time, you know, Uncle Jerry, it just, it, it's just so much work. And it's so frustrating when they see somebody who's 20 or 30 or 40 years old and they're in the hospital for 20 days and they have to put them on a ventilator. And they said, we have to keep them unconscious because it, they're gasping for air. And what my niece said to me is, it's like when you caught a fish as a kid and you put it off the hook and you put it and it, did, and it didn't go in a bucket of water if it's just on the ledge and it's gills. He says, that's what it looks like. And she says, sometimes there's nothing we can do. It's oh, tragic. It's tragic. But what, when did this happen to the extent, to the point where it began, you know, changing the reopening, you know, diminishing the number of tourists, I diminishing it, the industry? I guess it started in July, right? That's when the, the capacity of the hospitals couldn't handle it. They were just full. We just, we went from having, you know, 50 cases a day to, you know, 800, then 1,000. You know, yesterday we had 160,000 people test positive for COVID in the United States and nobody's saying anything. I was at the, be the beach on Friday, on Saturday night and there were 800 people protesting in front of the, uh, the zoo saying not to wear masks. Th this is an airborne virus. Before anybody could spell COVID and you went to the dentist, he put or she put a mask on before she drilled your mouth. Why? because the germs from her mouth can't go in your mouth. And maybe you do have bad breath and they, maybe that's why they worry. But most likely it goes to the germs. When I was a kid and I got cut and I had to get stitches, the doctor put a mask on before he stitched me. Why? From the germs from his mouth going in here. Masks stop the germs. Now, we have many kinds of masks. Why this, this great country of ours doesn't make N95 masks and hand them out is beyond my comprehension. I go to the park and someone has a dog. They have free dog bags to pick up the poop. There should be masks. Every time you get on an airplane, everybody should get a, a, an N95 mask. Not a bag of peanuts, not a bag of pretzels. I know peanuts are out now because allergic. Pretzels, <laughs> we, should go, we should go an N95 mask. They should be made in America. Why? Because this virus is not going away for a while. And this is something that I'm really, really disappointed in the government because they're dumping billions of dollars in everything. And we're not taking care of the stuff that we need to be taking care of. We yeah. need to understand that we're going to be wearing masks for a while. Now, if Hawaii, if we can get the majority of everybody vaccinated and we can lower the amount of COVID, then we can be a destination where no one comes in because we make them take a test before they come and they test after, and they have to be vaccinated, and then we'll be the premier destination. Yeah, I saw that in the article about the survey, and I, and I totally agree with you. We could be a primo destination. We could be a safe, we could sell safety. safety. We could sell health, and yeah. people would come from miles around to and enjoy that. they would that. pay, Jeff, Jay, Jay, they would pay, Jay. People will pay. There's money. I mean, I, um, I, I, have a, I have some slides here. If you look at the, the average daily rates that we had in June and July from the Hawaii Tourism Authority, it's amazing. It's especially the luxury market. You're just like, wow, up 30% from 2019, not 2020. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, this is a little small, but if you look, look at, look at this. Uh, this is July. The occupancy is down. Right, we lost occupancy, two point nine percent for the state. In the luxury market, you're down ten percent. But look at the average daily rate. The average daily rate is up thirty six percent, thirty six point seven. 
and now and rev par per available room up 20 percent 19.3 it's amazing it's amazing the well, amount of money it, it agrees with you people are willing to pay for a house they're willing to pay for hawaii culture hawaii yep. uh, special foods all that they want to celebrate the place we're yep. on a and roll we're on a roll in many we're on ways. a roll and because people haven't traveled in two years I, when I when I was talking to people just on the beach, they said we usually come for a week. We're coming for two weeks this time, and they're paying. And you know, this one couple, this family, they two three kids, they they got caught without having a car on Oahu. They had to pay three hundred dollars a day for an SUV. And he's, you know, that's a lot of money for a rent a car per day. I mean, I know you must have seen the story where it was a, they, you know, there was a thousand dollars a day for a convertible. <laughs> things like that, because artificial intelligence, you know, we use yield management and there was only a few rent, to, you know, convertibles left and they were able to charge that money. I don't know if anybody paid a thousand dollars a day, but I know that people are paying big, big money for hotels. You look at that West, you know, Lahaina and Maui. I mean, they're getting real money. Average daily rate, 800. Well, so what's, what's going to happen here? <clears throat> are those special prices, especially in the high end market, are they going to stay that way? Are they going to so. soften after a while? Uh, no, I think that if we can go back and make it safe, those folks will come. There's people that have money and they spend it. You know, people who pay $800 a night for a hotel room or $1,000 a night for a hotel room, they don't skimp. You know, they're not, they're not going over to ABC store, you know, buying sushi there. No, no, no. They're going to Roy's. And that's who yeah, you want. That's good for everybody. That's so good you, for everybody. Uh, you have more slides uh, you want to go through them um that's just yeah <laughs> i just got a couple of things on some data okay why don't we take a look at them okay yeah so visitor spending the total visitor spending in june was 144 uh, 1.44 billion compared to 2019 it was a decrease but we had a lot less tourists you know but july you know we had uh a million two seats coming in we had about a little under 900,000 people for the month of July. That was a really, really good month. Can we go to the next slide, please? And then, you know, you could see that from the visitors from the West Coast were really coming. And part of that is because they can't go to Mexico. You know, that it's, did, are people going to Mexico? Yes. Is it dangerous? Yes, very dangerous. Because there's nobody vaccinated over there. And if there is, there's very few. Same with the Caribbean. You know, we're getting that East Coast mainland folks because that they don't have the alternative markets. And when you have the supply, you have the product that people want, you can charge. You can charge. And that's supply and demand. And, you know, um, people that travel 11 hours, 12 hours on an airplane to get here, they stay a little longer. They're not coming for three days. They're coming. Let's for look at the other side for a minute, Jerry. Yep. I mean, the unions, Local 5, very unhappy. They have, they have not gotten back to their jobs. The restaurants are very unhappy. A lot of them have closed. There's not enough trade. Um, now, these, are, these support tourism. They're very important to tourism, and they are suffering. And maybe some of that suffering is going to be long-term suffering. So what do you say to them? Well, first of all, um, I, I, I'm glad that some of the folks have been rehired at the hotels. We're going through a shoulder period right now, and I would keep those employees. I would keep that because we're going to be ramping up in November, and, we, and the wave is going to come so fast and so strong. I believe you're not going to even see it coming. Just what happened in June. June and then July, it just came, and that's why you had lines outside the doors from every restaurant. They can't, you know, yes, there was capacity issues, but they, even in the hotels, they couldn't get people hired. Right now, most restaurants, the food service, they're looking both front of the house, back of the house. They're looking for good people, not just people, good people. But, you know, um, the, the hotels, there were hotels that, that haven't ramped up and they better be ready because it's going to come. They're going to come. And you can see, look at the average daily rates. Even the average, the, the mid-sized market, they still got the, the money. They didn't get the discount. They weren't, you know, they might have given you the, the, the rate at 190 but then someone else is paying 500 for that same room. You know, the, the average daily rates are, 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 are strong. So I want, to, I want to ask you for some advice, Jerry. Okay. Sure. Uh, advice to Local 5. What do you tell them? What's your advice to them right now in this transformational time? 
Um, I, I, I hear, I watch the news. They say that not everybody has been hired back. I would ask for a meeting and find out why. The hotel should be looking at the employees that they have that are already trained. Because what happens is when that wave came, they have to then retrain people. And one of the, you know, I was, somebody asked me a question one time, what do we do? I said, I would go back and ask, get, get the, my, my cooks or my waiters that I had before and give them a signing bonus. Because even $500 for them to come back, you have somebody who knows the system. They know, they fit the structure. You know, when you retrain somebody, it takes you, you have to retrain oh. me. Two people are not working at a time when you're already short staff. Yeah. And, and, and then what happens is the other workers are all overwhelmed. So they're tired. I mean, go to a restaurant these days, you know, at lunch, at dinner time and in Waikiki, go to, you know, Duke's or Cheesecake and all those places. There's lines outside the door. And, you know, customers, you know, one of the sad things that's happened here that I saw during this big push, a lot of people left their manners at home. Everybody's waiting for the table. Don't go up there and yell at the hostess. What do you think? She's hiding tables, <laughs> you know? And, I, and I've seen, you know, I, I was told today that somebody asked for their COVID card in New York and uh, uh, a person, the, the, the customers from Texas punched. Oh, that was in the paper. I saw that in the paper. Yeah. This is insane. That's insane. insane. It's crazy. When I ask you for your ID to drink for 21, nobody said anything. This is a mandate by the law. This isn't the waiter deciding this or the hostess. You're not allowed to. First of all, you're not allowed to touch anybody. And I heard that those were males that hit a female. They should be put in real jail. And we'll see what the DA does in New York. Uh, I'll see if she really does her work. Yeah, really, that'll be, they should be prosecuted for sure. But so really, let me but, ask you more advice now. Advice yeah. to the mom and pop hotels, the little ones, the boutiques. Um, what, uh, what do you tell them? Because they've been under tremendous economic Unbelievable pressure. pressure. I know that there's some COVID money. They we should be, you know, the sad part is the big hotels have the big lawyers that can fill out the forms the right way and get, and get, and get it. The small mom and pops, you know, same with the restaurants. They, they, they look at the paperwork and they say, oh, I just don't want to bother. And that's the government, you know, making things really, really complicated. And, you know, I, we need those, you know, those boutique hotels. We need those. That's part of the establishment of Hawaii. Yes, we have the big, the Sheratons, the Marriott's, the Hilton's, but the, the, the smaller ones are, are the uniqueness to it. And I, I think that the, the, the tourists that used to come there, you know, we'll be back. We'll be back. Uh, I so think hang, the, hang in there, hang in, hang there, in there. there. And, and I would have the government, you know, give them a tax break, you know, give them the tax break. Well, right well that now. was my next question, Jerry, the government, including HTA. What, what is your advice to them? Well, I, I like their Malama program. You know, they have this Malama initiative mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that's training people to give back. And, you know, people are willing to do that and they want to do something unique when they come to Hawaii. And, you know, whether they're, you know, working in a, a Lowy or a tarot patch or helping to rebuild a, an ancient fish pond or, or, or just helping clean the beach cleanup. You know, there's, a, there's some hotels that, especially high-end hotels on the Big Island and, and in, in, in Kauai, one of them is called the Cliffs. They just have these buckets and, and the tourists come and ask for the bucket and they walk along the beach in the morning and picking up the plastic and put it in there. Wow. Yeah, because they want to give back. They want it, they want it, they want the beach to be clean. Not just because they're there, but for the future. Now, did they bring the plastic to the beach? No. And and it, uh, is a lot of that plastic coming from Kauai residents? No. It's coming from the ocean. But they're doing their part. That's and a I think big that's a big message. What it says is that Hawaii is like the the destination resort treasure of the country. Yep. And, and people do treat it as a treasure. It is a treasure and people do treat it. Now, is there a, a group of folks that say tourists, they go home, tourists not come here? Yeah. I don't think they understand. Now, have there been bad tourists that walk in people's backyards to illegal hiking and stuff like that? Yes. Yes, we have that. But I'll tell you this, when people do that and then they get, they fall off the trail or they get hurt and we have to send our helicopter in, I would charge them. I would charge them. You don't follow the rules, I would charge you. Yeah. Charge tourists for the. You know how much it must cost for a helicopter to go and 
pick somebody oh, th like thousands, me. thousands yeah, for thousands. sure. Yeah, and I would definitely <laughs> charge them for that. And I'd let people know, you know, just like we had these folks that came through with fake COVID cards. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. They couldn't spell Moderna right. At least copy I remember. it from somebody. Could copy it. <laughs> you know, go back to high school. We used to copy off someone else's homework. I mean, get that one right. And, and the other folks that, that they had COVID cards for their kids that were like six. And what did we do to them? We really need, I, I'll tell you, if I, if I have a student in my class that cheats and the class sees it, and then the next class, that kid is sitting in the front row smiling like nothing happened, that hurts me and that hurts the other kids. You sure. need to be punished. And we need it. I don't know what happened to those folks, but whether the news didn't pick up on it or the state kept it quiet. But if you want to put it, make an example, you better put it out there. Yeah. Accountability. Accountability. <laughs> and, and let people know. This well, is what, what happens. Yeah. What what about the what about the people out there, local people who don't particularly like tourists? They, they never like tourists, yeah. And All now right. they say, let's limit the amount of tourism. Let's take this moment and limit it. Let's change it so it, it, it really doesn't cross our front lawn. Um let's um uh let's let's find other ways to do the economy. What do you say to them? Well, I I, I think that that's a good idea, but what, what do we do now with these 200,000 people that are working in this industry, that have been trained for this job? It's the same thing as being trained as a truck driver or being trained as a computer analyst. What are they, what are the skills do we have now for the, that can employ all these people? You know, one of the great things about Local 5 is the union. That union scale is really good and it's got the benefits, you know, when I talk, you know, we, we have international students in our classes because we have the highest percentage and highest number of international students in all of UH is the School of Travel Industry Management. When President Trump said that if we were going to go online, that we had to, that international students couldn't stay here. Remember, we really had to scramble at the Tim School. And what, did that, what that did is just showed that we had the highest number of international students in all of UH. Now, don't forget, those folks pay quadruple, right? Four times as much. So one of those is worth four local kids. We, what, what, what the union does is the union actually allows people to have a fair wage, a fair, fair wage. And with that, you know, we, we can then get people to, you know, if, if, if a local five for a property is get, person is making $25 an hour doing that same job at a, at another hotel that's not look that they're not unionized they have to be close they have to pay 24 or no one's going to work there they're going to just go to the thing so what local five has done is done a great job i used to be a local five guy i worked as a banquet waiter in the 80s at the sheraton waikiki um the uh, alan woodrow got me this job because he wanted me to i want a, a teacher work study grant Mm -hmm. and from the national restaurant association and what they wanted me to do is to go back to being a line worker to see what it's like so that when you're in the classroom you remember well, that's very valuable the manager what it's like to be a line worker and so I, what, what I, do you say jerry to what do you say to, to the members of the the leaders if you will of the hospitality industry including the hawaii lodging you know association and all that what do you say to them about trying to make peace with the local people so that the local people are willing to have tourism come back, willing to have more tourists among us, willing to uh, let tourism flower in the way, you know, that would that would benefit the state? What do you say to the industry as to how they should treat the local people? We need to help them understand. You need to share with them the true data, not, you know, I, one time I was talking about uh, the, the uh, illegal air, illegal vacation rentals, Airbnb, Vibro, those things. And I was saying how bad this was. And I got a comment from somebody who says, you are just a mouthpiece for the hotels. And I said, no, not true. I have no vested interest in the hotels. Yes. Do they hire my students? Uh, yes. And I want them to continue to hire my students. But that's not what I'm speaking about. What I was speaking about is we did a study on illegal vacation rentals and what the state needed to do. They didn't realize that, that we've had so many of them. 
25,000 illegal vacation rentals, but nobody built them. What they did was they displaced people from their houses. You know, and one of the, you know, first they said, oh, we're only, they only went into resort areas like Waikiki. Okay, so I know of one place where they purchased 40 apartments in, in, on Alawai, 40, four zero. These investors came in, they bought 40 of them and they put them on Airbnb. Now, what happened to those people that were living on those 40? I, for 17 years, I lived in Discovery Bay in Waikiki, right across the street from the Hilton Hawaii Village. And majority of my neighbors worked in the hospitality industry. A lot of them was, had studios. And then if you go a little, you know, you must admit Discovery Bay is a little high end. You know, it was very, very nice. I mean, you got you to admit that it was really, really a, a, a beautiful place. But uh, other places where they were having people live in studio, they had studios for $900 or $1,000 a month. And these folks worked in the hotels. And they would walk down to work every day and then walk back. They didn't need a car. And they could leave at 4 o'clock for a 4.30 shift, get there 15 minutes early, have a coffee, and they're ready to give the Aloha spirit. When they came in and bought all these units, and that was just one entity that bought 40 units, they displaced how many of those workers that would walk to work? Now, where do they live? They all yeah. had to find rent on the west side. Yeah, we have a housing shortage, don't we? Oh, you took, you took 25,000 units off the market. And then yeah. you're talking, those are the apartments, and they're the ones that say, oh, well, it's in Waikiki, it's okay. No. You had all these hospitality workers, whether it was a restaurant or hotels, they used to walk to work. Now they have to live on the west side and they have to get a car. They have to drive. They have to find parking and they have to leave an hour before. It could take an hour to get home or three or four hours like the other day when H1 got shut down. That's a very important point, Jerry. Right. And this is where Local 5, I want to ask Local 5, let me help you. I want to ask your employees who've been displaced by these vacation rentals you know oh it's in a resort area we could allow it no and you know they have this thing airbnb oh auntie sue's renting out her other room that's not what's happening you have these speculators these investors that are buying whole houses what really disrupted the, 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 the market is when they went into when nobody could afford to buy anything in kailua anymore and they started going into why manalo holly eva eva even they're even going into kaimuki Taking over the units. I had one of my friends come to visit. They went to the Airbnb. You know what they told them? Leave out the back door. If any neighbors, just say you're my friend. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? He felt he was like, he thought he was doing a drug deal. And, and, and this is what really has happened. And nobody did anything about it. Very interesting. And, Very interesting. And, and, and you know, when they charge this big money, you know, you had these investors. When we did one study on, on, on the disruption of Airbnb, Last year we did this study. When we asked the, you know, some of the folks from the, the residents, they said that one of them, he said, I only invested because the realtor told me. He said to me, I'll get you only get you don't even get one percent on your money in the bank, and I can guarantee you 20% and you don't have to do a thing. Airbnb posts it, Airbnb collects the money. We can actually even have Airbnb will send somebody in to clean it. You know, and I've stayed at Airbnbs in many places, uh just a year ago or two, right before COVID, I was in Vietnam in Da Nang and I rented a place. I got there. They had a little combination lock. They told me to combo. I got the key. I stayed there a week. I had my niece and my wife with me. We were uh, on vacation there and we left a week later. We just put the key on the counter, left, didn't see one person. The problem with the Airbnbs or the vacation rentals is they don't employ anybody. A person who stays in a hotel we have front desk, we have security, we have velvet, we have management, we have restaurants. These employ people. Tourism should be a, 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 an employer for the local population. You can't outsource that. While these vacation rentals, no one's employed. Oh, we have a gardener come. Get, get lost. Uh, no, 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 no. And you disrupt the neighborhood. You know, yeah. we, have, we have strange people down the block every day renting out a different out of the house. You know, we... You don't know who those people are. Mm -hmm. And you know, here in Hawaii, I, my house, I have no air conditioning. I have no heat. I have my screen door open. You know, this is how people live here. Most houses don't have that. We don't have security guards and things like that. 
and now you have strangers every week in the in the neighborhood number one number two the ones that have been revamped they took these houses where they displaced you know they moved the family probably multi-generation out like say in Haleiwa. they dumped another hundred grand into it put the flat screen tvs and put a barbecue in the backyard and they start charging people a thousand dollars a day or ten thousand for the week if they have a pool and guess what if i'm paying ten thousand dollars a week i'm inviting my cousins my friends and we're partying but everyone else has their windows open they have to go to work the next day but these guys are out at one in the morning doing cannonballs in the in the pool very disruptive yeah it really is a disruptive and nobody's looked at it from that standpoint you know, everything I'm, I'm glad you're covering that uh yeah, we're I'm almost out of know. time jerry and i want to yeah it's, uh, yeah I'm send me the, uh, the survey um and, and on the survey uh i just want to one last thing i'd like to talk to you about one last thing okay um yeah. and that's and that's the travel industry management school that is now part of the Scheidler Business College, yep. um, which is a tremendous thing. And it's a tremendous thing that you're there too, may I say. Um, so what you know, what you have is an industry that I would say is mature, an industry that has uh, been that has been doing business and improving its systems, its approaches. Um, you know, all of the aspects of hospitality are very mature in Hawaii, all over Hawaii. And you say to yourself, this is um, this is good to bring tourists in, but it's also good to train people. And so we can export certain aspects of it. We can export the expertise. We can export the trained people uh, and the systems, the software, um, all of those things to the world. And I have a mixed reaction on that. I, I think that travel industry management uh, at Scheidler is very valuable because uh, as in the past under Walter G, wasn't it? Um, the, the school has a tremendous influence and impact on tourism in Hawaii and, and on other places that want to see Hawaii. It's, a, it's sort of an exchange place. It's the hub of a wheel sort of thing. And, and I'm so happy that you're there and, and that you're doing what you're doing. Um, query, what role will Tim play going forward? And is it a good thing that we have this export product in terms of people and expertise that we that we, we send to the world? Uh, thoughts? Yeah, um, well, first of all, we, you know, one of the great things here is that we, we're known for our uh, Aloha spirit, our, our, you know, the Hawaii hospitality. We're world renowned, we're world renowned. And then I've been very fortunate at times to go around the world and train you know, we're consulting, whether I did it in Fiji or in the Middle East and throughout Asia. And, uh, you know, we do have this when you it's just like any other thing. When you work with a certain level of people, you everybody rises to that level or you'll be pushed down. Right. So because we were doing such a great job with service and, you know, don't forget, it's easy to, you know, serve customers in Hawaii because everybody's coming here for vacation, you know. It's not like you're going, you know, very few people come in here to lose a business deal, right? They come in here, honeymoon, you just gotta, you know, give the people what they want. And, and you know, we have the most beautiful weather on earth, the most clean water, clean air. You know, that's one thing people forget that live here. We really, really take it for granted how clean the air is here because the lots of part of this earth, you breathe in and you'll get a cough. You know, uh, in, in most of Southeast Asia and Taiwan, people have been wearing masks way before COVID. That was because of pollution. You go to any big city in China, you're wearing a mask, not because of, they didn't know no COVID before COVID, because of pollution. And we've got the best air in the world. And, you know, I don't really, you don't, you don't remember it until you leave. And when you come back, you're like, I come off that plane and I'm like, yeah, this is what it is. And we should be using our expertise in that service industry. To, to share with the rest of the world. And we do do that. A lot of our students, you know, uh, get trained here and they'll work for one of the big companies, Marriott Churn, and then they'll, to move up, they have to move out. You know, they go certain places. So is that, is that a good thing? Are, yes. are we losing something in the process? Well, we lose some, but then we get them back. A lot of them lose circle back. You know, there, there's some of them that, I just saw one when I was in Diné. We stayed at that, that condo that that, time she, that uh, Airbnb was at four points. I go up to the food to eat at the restaurant. The kid, the manager of the restaurant, is a graduate of the tip program, and he's a, a Vietnamese national. His family—he was born actually in the mainland, and 
he gets paid. Luckily, he doesn't get paid local fee, local rate. He gets paid from the other side. And um, yeah, he's hoping to come back one day. He's hoping to come back. But that's great. What it, what it means is that we are we are sending our expertise out. We are becoming a mecca, and we have to we have to treasure that so that in the future we continue to do that unabashedly. Be you know the center of expertise on the hospitality industry, destination resort industry, and and play that card. Um, and we need to be more connected with 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 the industry. You know, we need to be working with them. And you know, we do have you know, uh, we do do that, but we could do more. Mm -hmm. You know, we should be helping them. And you know, our students. You know, right now there is a, a, a you know with the COVID there was a dip. But now I think you know they, they're looking. They're always looking okay. for good ones. It they're all looks looking good, looking Jerry. Good. It all looks good. But you know what? I, I come I come away from this discussion thinking that I'm I'm bristling with additional questions for you. I'm bristling with issues that I want to talk to you about. And I hope we can get you back here, you know, from time to time to examine not only what's happening, um, but what could happen, what should happen in tourism vis-a-vis -vis the economy, as you called it, and I call it the same thing, the engine of our economy, like it or not, it's the engine. It's the engine of running this. It's the heart of the economy in, in Hawaii right now. And can, can we diversify? Yes, but it's going to take a while. And what do you do with a, guy, you know, a person that's been trained to do what they do and they're really good at it? I mean, one of the reasons we get such high marks in, in service is because that person might be you know, working for one of the hotels, Sheraton, even hour ago, whatever, some of those people, 30 years, 40 years, right? You know, you go to the awards banquet, HLTA has the awards banquet, employee of the year. You have people that 25 years, 30 years, 40 years. And, you know, one of the great things I, you know, I, I, I was in this, in this field before, you know, when I, when I were, were, was with Ritz Carlton, the great thing they had is we are ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen that's we're the same but our job is to serve and it's you know the tradition goes way back way back to you, the early this, 19th 20th yeah. century yeah and when you do this with you know it's an honorable job and you're making people happy and here in hawaii it's easy to make people happy why they got the best weather on earth <laughs> Jerry Agrusa, a professor at TIM, the Travel Industry Management School at Shiler at UH Manoa. So nice to talk to you, Jerry. I really enjoy this. And by the way, I understand that you were a shy child. A what? A shy child, yes, very much yeah. so. Yeah. Well, things have so. changed. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad I was able to come out of my shell. <laughs> and so am I. Thank you, Jerry Agrusa. Well, I want to <laughs> thank you, Jay, for inviting me and thank you for talking about our research this research paper. I think this is an opportune time that we, we, we just happen to get the paper out at a time when, you know, things could, we could share this with, with the, you know, administration of, of the tourism authority, as well as, you know, our government. And hopefully, uh, you know, some folks uh, on the ground here that will realize, you know, that not all tourists are bad. And I, you know, one of the folks that I was in a meeting with yesterday said that, so, you know, we have this very vocal minority of people that are anti-tourism and everybody believes that everyone's anti-tourism. And I don't think so. I think that there's a lot that understand that tourism is needed for the economy, number one. And number two is we have good tourists. We do. And what we need to do is just make sure we continue to market towards those good tourists. Okay. We're out of time, Jerry. Jerry Agrusa, thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you.